amuses me whenever I can find a good string of dad jokes, so I thought I would share them with you all. And then I have a few thoughts regarding Father's Day, just some things I wanted to share with you before we get to our study in the book of Galatians. I wanted to read some statistics for you, and, and this is actually uh, from an article from the Daily Wire, uh, written by a, a guy named Chris Sproles. But he cited some studies that were kind of troubling and wanted to just then encourage you in your fatherhood and how meaningful it is. So in today's America, we're experiencing a fatherhood crisis. I didn't know, I don't know if you knew this, but with the lack of involved fathers increasing dramatically in America in just essentially my lifetime, today almost one out of every four children in America live life without an active involved father. So that's 25%. Children with, and so then just some other statistics along that, those lines and in that regard, children with present and positive relationships with their dads are half as likely to show signs of depression, twice as likely to go to college, and 80% less likely to spend time in jail. Research shows that children born into fatherless homes are twice as likely to drop out of school, and fatherless boys are three times as likely to go to jail. Fatherless homes contribute to 70% of high school dropouts and 60% of youth suicides. So, with, with that, some Father's Day thoughts and encouragement for you. I just came up with four things to encourage you in your fatherhood. So first, be a man of God. Be a man of God. Short and sweet, real simple, easy to remember. And then practice what you preach. So in living out your faith and in living out your relationship with God, be a man of God and show your kids, show your family what that looks like. All of us desire that our children have a relationship with the Lord, to love Him, to serve Him. And so for us as fathers it becomes very important that we set that example. Um, I don't know if you've heard the saying that more often than not, things are caught rather than taught. So your children are observing your actions, how you go about your day-to-day life. If you are investing in your relationship with the Lord, your children are going to see that and be more prone to do that themselves and then lead them in that regard. So specifically in your regards, in regards to your relationship with Jesus, be a man of God. Ephesians 5.1 tells us, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So if we can imitate Christ, our children are imitating us. And so, and, and this is an argument that Paul makes quite a bit in his letters. Hey, Imitate me because I'm imitating Christ. And so if you're following my lead, ultimately you're going to be following Christ's lead. And so that should be our goal as dads. Be a man of God. Second, love your wife. Love your wife. She's the love of your life. She's the mother of your children. Love your wife. Invest in your relationship with her. Learn about her. Care for her. Take notes on her. Study her. And make sure that she is cherished and loved. You can bring no greater stability to your home than to love your wife and the mother of your children. Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So be a man of God and love your wife. Third, be involved in your kids' lives. It's a twofold task. First, invest in their lives. Point them to Jesus. Help them navigate the complexities of this world. The world is only getting more and more complex as we go. And if it's confusing for me to try to figure it out, it's going to be confusing for your kids. So help them along. Be present. Invest. Proverbs 22.6 Twenty-two six tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Secondly, institute godly discipline in your home. Be loving 
and consistent. A father who disciplines his children cares for them. So, so in the line of like setting an example and encouraging your children toward the Lord, there's also a sense of discipline, keeping them on the path of life, pointing them in their direction of Jesus. Proverbs 13, 24, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. You have to be present to be consistent, and you have to be involved in your kids' lives. So that's three so far. Be a man of God, love your wife, be involved in your kids' lives. And lastly, and, th- and these things were for no other reason than I was just praying about it, reading through Scripture, and landed on these things. So take it for what it is. Lastly, be gracious. Fathers, be gracious with your kids. Ephesians 6, 4 says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Grace is what draws us to our Heavenly Father. So, of course, implementing grace will draw the hearts of your children, our children, to ourselves, but also to to God. Grace is not license, so so don't get me wrong when I'm saying give your kids grace. This does not mean give your kids free reign to do whatever they want. But be gracious in your dealings with them as you're disciplining them, as you're consistently leading them to the Lord, as you're teaching them what life is and how to act and, and how to be, how to present themselves. Give them grace along the way. You aren't giving your children free reign to do what they have, whatever they want, but you are affording them grace just as God has shown us grace through his son. Um, you're exercising, and, and I just ran through Galatians 5, the, the fruit of the spirit, what grace looks like. You're exercising love rather than disdain. So, you, so you're cherishing your kids. You're exercising joy rather than grumpiness, peace rather than worry, patience rather than anger, Kindness rather than carelessness, goodness rather than evil, faithfulness rather than infidelity, gentleness rather than wrath, and self-control rather than a hot temper. All of these things put into practice translates into extending the grace of God to your kids, showing them what it looks like that our Heavenly Father is gracious to us. And they can have that physical, in real life example of what that looks like through their dad. Extending grace to your children will draw them into a better relationship with you and point them to the grace that our Heavenly Father has afforded them through Christ. So, look to Jesus. He's our example. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And as you go through this journey of fatherhood, know that He has equipped us. He's given us the gift of His Holy Spirit to Do it in and through you. So tap into that. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Point your children towards him. And you will fulfill your duty and calling as a father. Happy Father's Day. With that, we're going to be jumping into our study in the book of Galatians. Picking up Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be picking up in verse 12. Kind of a shorter message and a one-point outline, which is not the norm. But... It'll be good, nonetheless. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to pray for us, and then we will jump right in. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word, and I thank you that it does not leave us high and dry without any instruction. But Lord, you've given us your word that that equips us for everything that we need to know for that pertains to, to life and godliness and how we ought to conduct ourselves. And so, Lord, I pray that as we live this life, and as we journey through this relationship with you, would you draw us near to yourself, draw us near to your word, that we might be more well-equipped to lead our families, to love our wives, to love our kids. Thank you for, for showing us what the love of a father looks like. Thank you for sending us your only begotten son, the son whom you love, and giving him to us as a sacrifice that we might be able to experience what Paul has been talking about, being adopted children of God, and what a miracle that is that you have done for us. Thank you for affording us your amazing grace. We don't deserve it, yet you offer it freely as a gift. 
Help us to lay aside our pride, to humble ourselves, to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week we continued our study, picking up in Galatians chapter 4, as Paul is encouraging the believers to live as sons of freedom. He's continuing his comparison between slaves and sons, noting the differences of being a free son of God in Christ versus being a slave under the rule of the law. He urges them to be mature children in grace, to put away the childish things of legalism and to embrace the fact that God has sent his own son to redeem those who are under the law that we might then be adopted as sons, as as children of God. We're no longer slaves under the law, but we're free sons in the sight of God. Christ has redeemed us and God has adopted us. If we are in Christ, if he is in us and we are in him, we are now children of God. And so now because of the Christian's changed status, we also enjoy the perks of sonship, as Paul kind of outlined a few of those for us last week. That, and these include being co-heirs with Christ. And that's a mind-blowing thing to consider, that we are co-heirs with Christ, that he is set to receive an inheritance, that the Father is going to put everything under his feet. And us being co-heirs with him, everything will go under our feet as well crazy status that we have inherited being called children of God. We also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, a great perk, arguably the best perk. Um, and, And he becomes the assurance of our adoption and he becomes the empowerment of God in us that he he's the gift that that God has sent to all who believe and he wants to work in and through us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And in light of all this, All of these perks that are changed status, everything that Paul has ran through so far, in light of all of this, he is amazed that the Galatians would be willing to give it all up and exchange it for a life of bondage under the law. You're telling me, Paul says, you want to give all this up, the free grace, the the perks of sonship, and you want to put yourself back under the law? May it never be, Paul would say. They've already lived that life. They've already lived in bondage and been held in confinement by the elements of the world, Paul says in verse 3, and the elements of paganism that they've come out of. Then they've tasted the liberty in Christ, living in free, as free sons, but now they're looking to put themselves back under the bondage of the law. Well, Paul has more to share with them Uh, along these regards. He wants to break them out of that, pointing them to the free grace that is available to us in Christ. And he's going to use, point once again to Abraham as an example of what the, and contrasting the ideas of the law and grace. But before he gets to that, he takes this brief interlude of remembrance that we're going to be looking at this morning. And he just takes this opportunity to revisit what it was like when he first met the Galatians, what those circumstances were, and how it came about that he preached the gospel to them and their reception of it. So picking up in verse 12, we read, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, yeah, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They that is the Judaizers, zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and change my tone, for I have doubts about you. And so today we're just going to be looking at these these brief eight verses from 12 to 20, looking at 
as, as Paul encourages the Galatians, we're going to read his, his encouragement to the Galatians in verse 12. We're going to read about his experience among the Galatians in verses 13 through 15. We're going to be looking at Paul's strategy. Paul's strategy is essentially just to tell the truth. He's not, he's not beating around the bush. He's telling the truth in verse 16. We're then going to be seeing what Paul has to say about the Judaizers and the insight that he gives into their strategy in verses 17 and 18, as opposed to how he operated among the Galatians. We're going to be looking at Paul's commitment, that it's, it's a parental commitment, like a father, like a mother, in verse 19. And then we're going to be looking at Paul's delivery, that it is a no-frills, no-fluff delivery. He's just getting straight to the point. In this section, Paul takes the opportunity to appeal to the memory of his readers. And, he's, and he takes this opportunity to point out the stark contrast between his ministry and the ministry that was going, the false ministry of the Judaizers. And as he goes through, he recounts the circumstances regarding his time there. In verse 12, as we start out, Paul's, he first urges the Galatians to be consistent in their walk. We read, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. Paul's call to imitation here is not out of a sense of pride, but out of a sense of consistency. Paul's urging the Galatians to be consistent in their walk with Christ, to commit themselves to him, to and not to waver or waffle between their relationship with him and then also this futile practice of religion that they've fallen into. Hey, be consistent. Commit yourselves to Christ. His thoughts, I believe, can be summarized by reading a similar call to the believers in Corinth when he writes in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Being like Paul is not great because Paul is great, but because his life is modeled after Jesus Christ. So what Paul is essentially saying is, be like Christ. He's not saying be like Paul so much as he's saying, be like Christ. And he's ultimately the one that we aim to imitate. Within verse 12, we also are given a clue into the commitment level to Paul, and to the gospel message that he preached. In verse 12b, we read that he, he says, For I became like you. This, in fact, is a, a... I think that it can be read as a kind of a twofold statement and a twofold testament to Paul's commitment to the gospel. That first, Paul identified with the struggle of the Galatian believers. He had been there. If anybody knew about the struggle with legalism, if anybody knew about the struggle with adhering to the law, it was Paul, because he'd walked in their shoes. He had become a Christian after growing up and being brought up in Judaism, knowing the legalistic lifestyle. We read about Paul that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, under the law blameless, he says of himself. And so he was well aware of this struggle that the Galatians were in, that their struggle was, how much do we commit to the law? Is this our saving route? And as we've, as we've made our way through, we know that, that Paul has argued that, no, the law does not save us. It simply points us to our need, that we need a Savior. That the law is our plumb line. And we line up ourselves with, with God's law. That we, and we find out by lining ourselves up, putting ourselves up against it, that we don't measure up. That God is perfect. Nate is not. And so we need something outside of ourselves to save us. And that's the grace that God has afforded us through Christ. So Paul is well aware of the struggle with legalism that the Galatians are in. Second, Paul's commitment to the gospel and sharing the good news of Jesus led him to employ different tactics depending on the audience he was witnessing to. Paul continued to employ the strategy throughout his ministry. And as we read in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 9, 
verses 9 through 23, he kind of gives us a summary of, of his strategy in ministry. In 19, we read, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win some who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. A few thoughts from Warren Wearsby on this passage and on Paul's commitment to the gospel. He writes, it is unfortunate that the phrase all things to all men has been used and abused by the world and made to mean that Paul, what Paul did not intend for it to mean. Paul was not a chameleon who changed his message and methods with each new situation, nor was Paul a compromiser who adjusted his message to please his audience. He was an ambassador, not a politician. Warren Wiersbe continues, Paul had the right to eat whatever pleased him, but he gave up that right so that he might win the Jews. Paul revered the law, see Romans 7.12, but set that aside so that he might reach the lost Gentiles. He even identified himself with the legalistic weak Christians so that he might help them to grow. It was not compromise, but rather total abandonment to the higher law of love. I think an important thing to note that within this context, Paul never changed his message. The message was the same. That we're saved by grace, through faith, in Christ. That message never changed. How Paul went about delivering that message as far as, well, is he sitting down with, with the Jews today? And is he going to restrict what he's eating? Or is he sitting down with, with the Gentiles today? And he's just going to partake. Paul was willing to do whatever it took to get the gospel to wherever it needed to go in order that he might save some. That was Paul's desire. Paul never compromised his message. Rather, he was willing to give up whatever rights he had or even give up liberty that he practiced in order to reach the lost for Christ. And now as we move into verse 13, we see Paul recount his experience and reflect on the circumstances surrounding his time in the region and, and what brought him to the Galatians in the first place. In verse 13, we read, you know that because of Physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. There's a lot of speculation surrounding these, these few verses and as to what it actually was that ailed Paul at this point in time. With, and there's actually quite a few possibilities to present themselves, just to list them out to you. It could be tied to the fact, if you read through Acts 14, or the latter parts of 13 through 16, I believe it is, you kind of get the record of his first missionary journey, and you get his time spent in the region of Galatia. So... It could be, so Paul's physical infirmity, it could be tied to the fact that he was stoned in Lystra in Acts 14, 19 and 20. We read that in that town, there was a bunch of Jewish men who were super mad at him for preaching the gospel. And so they stir up a bunch of people, they take him, they throw him out of town, they stone him, leave him for dead. Well, then Barnabas comes along, picks him up, dusts him off, and then they keep going along their way. People usually died from, from being stoned. Not stoned like Colorado stoned, but like stoned with rocks. And you could die from that too, but we can... We'll just separate those things. So stoned with rocks is what we're talking about. A bloody ordeal, broken and bloody in the body. Um, 
so whatever happened there, that could have led to the ailment that, that Paul, like, he had to get fixed up. So they had to go then into the next town, find some medic, get him some medical attention. That's what led him into the Galatian region. It's also possible that it had something to do with his eyes, specifically because of the reference here in 15 that they would have willingly gave Paul their own eyes. Along with the reference in 6.11, Paul talks about signing and writing the letter with his own hand and using large letters. A lot of biblical scholars um, contribute these, these things to the fact that maybe Paul had an eyesight issue and that this is what he was dealing with and that this ailment was, was the one that the Galatian received and, and helped him with. There's some other speculation that he may have had malaria or some other ailment in, in that vein because it was common in the region. It's supposedly a swampy region in this area and whatever. All that being said, there's a dude named C.R. Stam. He has a, a, a good summary assessment. The difficulty of diagnosing the case of a living patient should warn us of the futility of attempting it for one who has been dead over 1,900 years. So, you can speculate all you want, guess all you want, we're not quite sure. Make your case for whichever one. I don't think that there's a wrong answer. Whatever it was that first led Paul into the region of Galatia, and it seems that, that, that he went into this region on account of this infirmity, that his physical ailment or his appearance did not deter the Galatians from receiving him and his message. So as we move into verse 14, we see that they did not connect the outward appearance of Paul with the power and validity of his message. In my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So the Galatians were willing to receive what he said, regardless of how he looked, or regardless of the circumstances that led him there. And because they believed in the content of his message, they proved themselves of a humble nature that they were willing to receive Paul in such a way. And, and they give for us a lesson that one's physical appearance does not equal qualification. That's one of my favorite things about Calvary Chapel churches, that Calvary, past, Calvary Chapel pastors come in all shapes and sizes. You have guys like Gino Geraci, who's kind of a smaller in stature, Italian man who's very heady and, and knows the scripture well, one of the most brilliant Bible teachers there is. There's guys like Daniel Fusco, head of dreads, down to here, teaching up in Oregon. And, it's, and it spans the gamut from there. You have this like Colorado wannabe surfer dude who ends up behind the pulpit and in Laramie, Wyoming. That's it does like don't let appearances, let the content of the message be the qualifier. Don't don't discredit someone because of how they might look. And Paul is commending the Galatians that they did this with him. And yet, in spite of the circumstances surrounding Paul's initial interaction with the Galatians, their acceptance of him, he was a blessing to them and they to him in return. That what then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So Paul's just, he's wanting to call to mind the closeness of their relationship, that they enjoyed fellowship together. Paul's writing them this letter. He's a He's very straightforward in talking to them. He says some things that might come across as offensive, but Paul's saying, hey, remember this rapport that I built with you? Remember this close relationship that we had? Don't, remember, don't you remember how I cared for you and you cared for me? So let's build off of that. Let's establish that fact. I care for you. You cared for me. So verse 16 comes up. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? In light of this relationship that we've built, in light of the fellowship that we've shared, does it seem odd that I would tell you the truth? Does it hurt your feelings, me talking to you this way, Paul might say? It's a rhetorical question, of course, that Paul's not shy to speak the truth 
In fact, it's his, it's his MO. It's what he does from the very beginning. He speaks the truth. And it's also essential to the Galatians at this point in their journey that Paul is going to declare to them the truth. David Gusick writes, in light of the great love and honor the Galatians had shown toward Paul, and in light of the great blessing they received from God when they showed such to him, the Galatians should not think that Paul has now become their adversary when he confronted them with the truth. They needed the truth more than they needed to feel good about where they were at. They needed the truth more than they needed to feel good about where they were at. Our culture today is all about validating your feelings. What feels good, do it. What our culture needs now is a shot in the arm of the truth, even if it means hurting some feelings along the way. And that's what Paul is willing to engage in. Let's talk about the truth. It would do the Galatians no good it would do the Galatians no good to have Paul come alongside and congratulate them for their decisions. Tell them something along the, the lines of, oh, you believe your truth, blah, 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 whatever that is. That message is useless to the Galatians because if Paul comes along and he says, oh, yeah, like, you just do you, man. What they're going to do is go down the road of bondage. Committing themselves, putting themselves into slavery under the law that they could never keep. So Paul confronts them with the truth. He valued the truth. He preached the truth. He contended and fought for the truth. We've already read that, that he was willing to withstand Peter to his face in chapter 2 for the sake of the truth. He writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 along these lines, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Paul's talking about He's encouraging Timothy to, to remain committed to the message of the truth, but also within these verses to Timothy, we can read that there's also value in wanting and a desire to hear the truth and seeking to find the truth rather than just having and accepting what sounds good to you. Don't have itching ears. Don't be taken away by fables and false teachings. Listen to the truth. Third John uh, verse 4, we read that, John writes there that I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Paul would share this sentiment. Chuck Smith writes, you know, some people make it hard to really be honest and truthful with them because of the way they react. Some people rebel against the truth. Some people don't want to hear the truth. I'm comfortable the way I am. Don't bother me with facts. My mind is made up. Now I don't want the truth. Tell me how well I am. Tell me how good I am. Tell me how nice I am. Don't tell me the truth because I don't want to hear the truth. And so there are those who are bound within a certain system in relating to God. This is the way my father did it. This is the way my grandparents did it. Don't bother me with the truth. I'm happy here. I'm satisfied here. I don't have to do much. Just sit and watch. And people are disturbed by the truth. Paul said, have I become your enemy because I've told you the truth? And so it's good... Maybe you're a person who's on the receiving end of a critique. Maybe you're a person who's on the receiving end of a dissatisfied, whatever it is. Suck it up, take it for what it is, and move on. 
Don't let your feelings get hurt when someone speaks truth into your life. Maybe they didn't present it in the right way. Maybe it, maybe it was maybe it was too hard or too harsh the way it was the message was delivered. Analyze the content of the message. Don't be offended and move on. Offense is taken, not given. So if you can live your life without being offended, you, you've done yourself a lot of good. You can make a ton of progress. Just don't be offended. Give people grace. Don't take it personal. Analyze the message. If it applies to you, great. If it doesn't, move on. Move on. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Paul is encouraging the Galatians in this vein. Don't be offended. Be willing to take personal inventory. Listen to what I'm saying to you and come back to the truth. He's dealing with them honestly because he loves them. So, and, and that's a message that's gotten lost in culture that if you love somebody, you don't ever tell them something that they don't want to hear, or something that will hurt their feelings. Well, guess what? If you love somebody a lot, you'll tell them the truth. And we know that Paul loves these Galatian believers because he's willing to tell them the truth. And this comes, this message and how Paul delivers it is in stark contrast to the Judaizers and the message that they were preaching among the Galatians. That, that the, the, the Judaizers only viewed the Galatians as checking a box or gaining followers rather than Paul who describes them as beloved children. We read in Proverbs 27, verse 6, that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And so I think that we see that stark contrast between Paul and his message and the Judaizers and his message, that the wounds of a friend, that Paul is willing to wound them because he loves them, and yet the kisses of the enemy bring deceit. Paul had proven his love for the Galatians by telling them the truth. His feelings are genuine, yet they are drawn away by the deceitful and cunning strategy of the Judaizers. We read that they zealously court you in verse 17, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I am present with you. Verse 17, I kind of labeled as the mean girl strategy to ministry. That exclusion leads to jealousy, leads to wanting to be included. And so the Judaizers, were, they kind of had this click going. And they were willing, they like kind of like told all the Galatian believers like, hey, like you could be a part of our click, but you're not quite cool enough. And so the Galatians were like, man, how do I get in there? I just want to be a part of the group. And so this exclusion led to this jealousy where now the Galatian believers are willing to like be zealous for the false teach these 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 Judaizers who are only leading them astray the the Judaizers don't display a heart for the people of Galatia they do not care for them as part of ministering to them they only care for them as a sense of pumping up their own numbers hey guess how many people I got to the group this week and that's how they were going about their strategy. And Paul writes that, Paul comments on this zealousness that, that being zealous in and of itself is not bad. However, being zealous for the wrong thing is bad. It's like expending all of your energy in the wrong direction. <laughs> Brielle and I, on our anniversary trip last year, we were, we were walking in, in Custer National Park and, and uh, Headed, we were headed to the game lodge or whatever. Well, we walked two miles in the completely wrong direction. And so a, a 10 mile walk turned into a 12 mile walk because we had to, or a 14 mile walk because we walked two miles and then two miles and then we were back to where we started and then had to get to where we wanted to go. And so you can be zealous all you want, but if what you're zealous for isn't the right thing, you're just going to expend your energy in the wrong direction. You can be as passionate as you want about something that isn't true, but all the passion you can expend doesn't make it any less false. Your anchor... So, there's, there's a story about, about uh, 
a high school teacher who took all of his class up on the roof of a building and, and he was going to rappel down off of the building. So he gets all of his, all, he gets all anchored up and all of his climbing gear anchors off to a, to a pole at the top of the school, hops off, pole breaks, he falls to his death. What was wrong? He was passionate. He wanted to teach his kids. He was, he was illustrating a point. But what he had put his trust in was faulty. Put your trust in something that is going to hold. Put your trust in the truth that it might last. And you can have all the zeal in you, it, that you want to expend for the sake of truth. And it will get you somewhere. Good intentions do you no good when the cause is bad. David Gusick writes, the Galatian Christians were no doubt impressed by the zeal of the legalists. The legalists were so sincere, so passionate about their beliefs. Paul agreed that it is good to be zealous, but only in a good thing always. Zeal in the service of a lie is a dangerous thing. The Judaizers viewed the Galatians through the lens of progress, only wanting to pump themselves up, make themselves feel good, but Paul viewed them as his own children. And Paul ministered to them that he might encourage them. He writes in verse 19, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Paul in this section reversed the Galatians in, in, a, in a loving way, in a loving manner. Watching the Galatians waver in their faith has become discouraging to Paul. And he's feeling as though... His time spent in working and laboring among them, that it's all for naught, that he spent that time in vain. It almost feels as though he has to start all over. And the imagery is actually pretty rich because Paul, Paul kind of, he takes on this fatherhood role, but he also takes on the role of the mother, that he feels like he labored for these Galatian believers, that they were brought forth through pain and agony as in childbirth. And now he feels like he has to go and go through that process all again because of their backslidden state. Ask your mom about what it was like to give birth to you. Ask her if she would like to do that again. Most likely not. But probably because she's your mother, she would for you. That's what Paul is saying. I'm going to labor again for you because I love you. And it's a testament of his genuine love for them that he's gone through the labor pain. He's gone through the effort on their behalf. And Paul likens himself to their spiritual mother who's given birth. And now he feels like he has to do it all over again. John Stott writes, he likens his pain to the pangs of childbirth. He had been in labor over them previously at the time of their conversion when they were brought to birth. Now their backsliding has caused him another confinement. He's in labor again. The first time there had been a miscarriage. This time he longs that Christ will be truly formed in them. And Paul's desire is that he wants to be with them, to speak tenderly towards them, to be among them, because their actions have led them led Paul, as he's examining their actions, to kind of doubt the genuine nature of their salvation. However, and, and this becomes the necessity for Paul's letter. He's writing to the Galatians because it's necessary. He's writing to the Galatians because it's urgent. Foreigner, it's urgent. So urgent. Anyways, um, it's urgent. That's why Paul's writing this letter. It's circumstances in the state of the believers in Galatia. They don't allow, and, and the message is straightforward. Paul's not mincing words. And it doesn't allow the message, the timing, the, the fact that it's urgent, it doesn't allow for tender words. The situation is critical and therefore necessitates bold, curt words. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. But it's implied, I can't change my tone because the message is urgent. It's like watching your toddler heading towards the street. You don't say, honey, I think it would be better if you turned around and came back. No. Hey, turn around. Get your butt back here. It's urgent. It's dangerous. What you're facing has high consequences. And that's what Paul is engaging in. 
curt, direct, urgent language. But Paul wants them all to know, hey, it's because I love you. It's because I care about you. It's because we've built up this rapport, this relationship. So I'm willing to tell you the truth, even at the possibility that it might hurt your feelings. I'm hoping that you'll see the genuine nature of my message, that you'll receive it, Paul says. And so to close our time this morning, it's kind of a, it's kind of a cool little passage. I mean, like, the, and, and I, I think that really in closing, we can just keep it real simple. And, and I wanted to encourage you in, to notice just two things. First, the love of a pastor for his people. Paul loved the Galatians. And he wanted what was best for them. And what did this motivate him to do? Two things. Tell them the truth and point them to Christ. If your pastor's not doing that, find a new church. If your pastor's not, if he's tickling your ears, if he's just telling you stuff that makes you feel good, but it doesn't actually contribute to your relationship with Christ, if he doesn't actually tell you, hey, you have a big problem. You're a sinner. You need a savior. Otherwise, you're facing dire consequences and eternity separated from the God who loves you. So, honestly, truthfully, receive the free gift of grace that God has afforded to you, that there's salvation in His Son. Humble yourself in His presence. Allow Him, allow His assessment of you, agree with that assessment, that I'm a sinner, the wages for my sin is death, and then receive the free gift of God in, uh, of grace and salvation, the gift of everlasting life in Christ Jesus. The love of a pastor for his people will motivate him to tell the truth, point them to Christ, that Christ might be formed in you, that Christ might be formed in those who hear. Any Bible teacher worth his salt shares this sentiment and desires that ultimately those who hear the message hear Christ. That those who, who read their Bibles, who follow along from Sunday to Sunday, are encouraged more in their relationship with Jesus Christ. So we see the love of a pastor for his people. And then secondly, we see the people and their response. How should a congregation receive this message? Two ways, with discernment and with diligence. It's funny, one of my favorite Bible teachers to listen to is Chuck Missler. The dude is brilliant. I mean, brilliant. And so you're listening to him, and, and I hang on every word he says, because his Bible knowledge is incredible. And then, and so, but it's hilarious because the majority of his message is he starts out with the Acts 1711 caveat, which is don't believe a word Nate Dimbo says. Use the Berean method, Acts 17.11, confirm the truth of the message. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Paul and his crew were in the region, they were preaching, and the Bereans were stoked to receive it. But they went home, they sat down with their Bibles, and they confirmed what Paul was saying. Do that. Put that into your own practice. Don't just take what Nate says as, uh, uh, oh, Nate said it, so it must be true. No. If the Bible said it, it's true. If, If what I'm saying points you back to the Bible, may it be of use to you. Good. Amen. Point you to truth. Point you to Jesus. But use discernment. Be diligent. The second aspect after hearing the truth of the message, is to then diligently apply it. What are you hearing? Receive it. Apply it. How can I use this? Holy Spirit, how can you work this, what you have said in your word, make the book live to me? Holy Spirit, take it that I might live it out. And I just a couple... 
we'll just close with these thoughts from Alistair Begg because I feel like he has a great summary of, of this whole section, the heart of a pastor and, the, and how it's knit with the heart of his people. These verses then are a personal appeal that Christ might be formed in you. The longing of my heart for this congregation is that Christ might be formed in you, that you will embrace the truth of Scripture and ask the Spirit of God to apply it to your heart. And all the time when preaching is taking place, you will ask this question, is the word of Christ coming to my heart today? And as I am preaching, I will ask this question, is the image of Christ being formed in the hearts of the people? If I preach longing for Christ's image to be formed to be formed in you and if you listen for his word to be preached all our eyes will be focused on Jesus who is the key to the reciprocal relationship between pastor and people set your eyes on Jesus the author and finisher of your faith lord thank you for this morning thank you for your word and lord i thank you that you preached your gospel using real men with real struggles, with real doubts, that, that Paul doubted the, the state of the Galatians, and, and that doubt led him to writing them a letter. Hey, I'm concerned for you. I'm seeing this, this pattern coming along in your lives, and I want to encourage you to, hey, don't stray from the path. Come back. Come back to the knowledge of the saving grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Don't try and put yourselves under the yoke of bondage again because it's a futile ask and it's a futile task to commit yourself to. Lord, I thank you for preserving these words for us. That the letter to the Galatians is, is a letter to us in Laramie, Wyoming. That we are, con, con, that we are encouraged to walk in grace, to walk in grace. And I thank you, Lord, that you, you also care for your people, that you cared to, to give us your word, that you cared to encourage us by it, that we might know you more, that we might love you more. Help us. Make, make the book live to me. And may I live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?